Yeah, that's fantastic. Nice and warm and things are going really nice, I think. We just had a little problem with our chat facility. Unfortunately, the amount of people that have tried to log in, uh, we've had a little server error. So, uh, fingers crossed, that will rectify itself in a few minutes. If need be, you can pop over to peoplesinternetradio.com. There's a chat room there. You can log in there and you'll be able to ask questions and chat to us on that. Right, now our guests on the show tonight are two chaps. One is Curry Good and the other one is David Wilcox. Now David has been on the show a few years ago. So we're going to be playing uh, catch up with Curry and David because there's an awful lot of things going on at the moment. Um, from a, a national, international and global level and obviously on a cosmic and universal level. So before we do that, we'll find out what the communication channels are. Yes, communication channels this evening are... The communication channels are email info at oymireland.com by phone 046 927 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. Yes, 046-927-1212 is the number for the studio this evening. Uh, we also have the website, that is oamradio.com. Uh, we have three streams available from the top of the website there. You, will, you can p- pick a stream and listen to your heart's content. We are streaming in Ireland, streaming in the UK and across in the US of A as well. We've also got anti-social media, that is Facebook. You can check us out there, see what we're up to. And... Uh, just log on to Facebook, uh, just basically search Open Your Mind, you will find us there, you'll recognise the logo. We also have the TuneIn Radio app for your listening pleasure on Android and iPhone devices. Just Again, just go to TuneInRadio.com or download the, the, uh, the little app for your chosen device and just do a little search there for Open Your Mind or OIM, you will also find us in there. We've also got the YouTube channel for your listening pleasure as well, we've got some videos on there too. Anyway, there we go. Alan. Brilliant, Steve. Okay, now, as I said, there's an awful lot of things going on. I'll just say, well done, Greece, by the way, who are organising a referendum for the people. That's true democracy. Obviously, that would never happen in Ireland because we don't have that kind of government over here. So, um, hopefully it goes well. Hopefully get the, the, uh, they get the vote that they want. Uh, fingers crossed. And... Um, they won't you get know, it if it's nothing to do with Ireland. The Irish yeah. government, I can tell you. Well, they wouldn't support them anyway. No. So, but uh, good luck, Greece. We'll fo- probably find out tomorrow about uh, about uh, how that goes anyway and, and what's happening over there. Right. Okay. Just uh, we're going to get our guests on because we know we have an awful lot to talk about, and we know, like on a local scale, there's Irish water protests and property charge protests and corruption and suicides and uh, evictions going on in Ireland. And on a European scale, we have mass austerity across Europe. Uh, Greece, obviously, organising a referendum for the people, which is good. Uh, but playing chicken with the IMF. And uh, 1.6 billion due, I believe, at the end of the month, that Greece have to pay the IMF. And in multiple countries, uh, Eastern Europe and Yemen, all the, kind of the, the wars that are going on there. And on a global scale, we have earthquakes and volcanoes, especially the Ring of Fire going off. Um, flooding, mass animal deaths, poisoning, you know, our food, our land, Fukushima and all that. So, you know, basically what we need to know is on a global scale, um, what's really happening happening on that, basically on a, on a global cosmic scale. Um, we need to kind of, the best people to speak to, I suppose, are David and Curry. They're the two best people, really, that you could have on the show to talk about the things that are going on there. So, um you know, there's an awful lot of talk about Ascension, there's an awful lot of talk about Planet X, an awful lot of things going on that, you know, Sky Anomalies, we had Joanne Kramer on last week talking about Sky Anomalies and, and things like that that are going on. So, um, and I believe that uh, David and Corey have information that they haven't released, so they're going to be releasing it uh, on their show tonight, which is, they have an exclusive tonight on their show, I believe, with the information that's going to be released. Before we bring David and Corey in, Steve is just going to give us a quick bio on Corey and David. Yeah, uh, again, as Alan, as Alan mentioned, uh, David has actually been on the show before. But for those of you who may not be familiar with the lads, I'm going to just give a, a quick little bio on both chaps here. So, Corey Good, Corey Good has 20 years' experience in uh, physical and IT security, communications, support in banking industry, counter electronic surveillance, risk assessment, executive protection. Army C-41 program experience, my lab, 1976 to 1986-87. 
Uh, recruit into multiple Black Ops program and SSP experience. 17 MyLab experience. 20 years uh, from 86 to 2007 with some recall work done in 89 through the, through to the present time in various and programs that fall under the MyLab umbrella. Uh, 20 and back age regression programs including IE support for ERT delegations, off World Federation conferences, six years in SSP assigned to non-military R&D vessel, uh, that is the ASSR, ISRV Auxiliary Specialised Space Research, uh, Interstellar Class Vehicle, Intruder Intercept Interrogation Program. And that is uh, just a little bit on Corey. David, however, David is a professional lecturer, filmmaker and researcher of ancient civilizations, consciousness, science and new paradigms of matter and energy. His upcoming Hollywood film Convergence unveils the proof that all life on Earth is united in a field of consciousness which affects our minds in fascinating ways. Brilliant stuff. Now, Corey and David are very, very busy people, so we're lucky to have them on the show. And um, so basically, hold on to your seats because uh, the information you're going to hear tonight is going to be mind-blowing. Good evening, chaps. How are you doing? Very well. Doing, doing well, thank you. Great stuff. Right, so just so people know who's who, I'll just say, good evening, Corey. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And David, good evening. How are you? Uh, it's the first time I've been called a lad or a chap in quite some time, and I'm happy about that. <laughs> no problem at all. Glad to have both. I'm here. waiting for mate now. Do you guys use mate too, or is that more Australian? Uh, that's more Australian, really. And we you, can we can deal with it if you like, mate. That's in, in the <laughs> U- yeah, in, in the UK they'd probably call you mate as well. But we we yeah. can do that. We can do that. Um, chaps, it's brilliant having both you on. I know you have exclusive information. You're going to be talking to us about tonight and it's really good now we just talked before the show and i think a lot of people are going to be really interested to find out really what's happening now regarding a cosmic universal level on a planetary level and basically what's going to be happening in the future but um david i think you can probably give us a quick synopsis on basically a little bit of history before we move on because we only have an hour and 45 minutes and we're going to try and cram in as much as we can in that time and we know that we won't be able to get through all the questions because there's going to be loads of questions coming in but we will do our best but David if I pass it over to you if you want to do a quick um, intro and then we'll take it from there. Sure I appreciate that Alan. Uh, My experience with this black ops world, if you want to call it that, goes back to when I was in college and a friend of mine had his physics professor tell the whole class that Roswell really happened and that it was being concealed by NASA. He then had a private meeting with that professor and the professor told him that, in fact, Roswell did happen and told him about the propulsion systems and said there were three types of beings in the craft and that the tallest of them looked like humans on Earth. Uh, This actually was what triggered me into doing UFO research. The year was 1993 when I got this information, and I began to just devour books, and over the years I hunted out insiders, and it has been a very hard-earned, painstaking journey to find people who know what's going on. Uh, It becomes clear, once you really get into this, that Roswell did happen, that... The United States military industrial complex did develop anti-gravity craft, but then you have to jump much farther down the rabbit hole to see that if they have craft that could leave the Earth, they obviously have been doing it for a long time, and if they're going to go out into our solar system, they're going to build stuff. So what we now have, according to Corey's most recent information, is a faction within what is called the Secret Space Program, or SSP, and that faction is called the Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate, or ICC. So if Corey says ICC, that's what he's talking about. The ICC is a group of all the major big military defense contractors, and they have gone into business. That's the main thing they're doing out there, is manufacturing technology that is so high-tech they would never want it to be manufactured on Earth because they're worried that we would get our hands on it. So they have become extremely advanced. They have very high sophistication. And we just found out that they are, in fact, in very regular trade with almost 900 different extraterrestrial civilizations. 
because their stuff is the best on the block. And then there are many more civilizations that they have some degree of trade with. So we are talking about a massive, massive industrial operation. If you think about what the United States was like in the first half of the 20th century, all the industrialization that took place with the development of the automobile and the development of paved roads, and then on into World War II and how the people were used to build bombs and aircraft and weapons, all that type of momentum has continued. It's just that it's all been moved up into space, and all the money that has been stolen from us through a variety of false flags and you know, human trafficking, drug smuggling, pornography, uh, financial tyranny, fake wars, they're always a lot more expensive than what it really costs, and all the profits are being taken and developed into space, which has now created a huge, huge industrial operation with technology so advanced that once it is returned to the people, and that's what all this is about, is is a revolution that is taking place in the space program that Corey is on the cutting edge of. That revolution will lead to humans on Earth getting technology that will immediately put us into everything you see on Star Trek. Right. And how soon do you think this is going to happen? Corey, what do you think? I don't know. Well, you know, a lot of that depends on us. Um, you know, there's so many dates that have been put forth that, you know, come and go that, you know, I'm not going to put out an arbitrary date. Um, but um, from everything that's being told to me by the the Blue Avians is that uh, much of this depends on us. And, um, you know, our, us going through our awakening process and uh, it's going to occur – um, by there, there has been a lot of uh, intel that's been gathered by uh, um, defectors from, I guess, the Earth terms are like the Illuminati, Cabal, um, that kind of thing. In the secret space program, they like to take away the mystique and the magic and just call them secret Earth government syndicates to make them the criminals that they really are. And um, a lot of these people have seen the writing on the wall, and they've defected, and they've been provi providing a lot of information and also agreeing to testify in the, in, the, in the near future. Okay, can I touch base with you on that? Because what we're seeing here, obviously, what we see on the Internet and things that are going on, even with the shooting in Tunisia and the last, you know, just false flags and things going on, if the cabal are, if their back is against the wall and they realise that they're losing the battle and some are defecting over to the good side, surely we would we would see a ramping down or a closing down of the, the the system and things starting to change. But what we're seeing from where what we're, from where we we are sitting is an increase. We're seeing more of a totalitarian government. We're seeing Absolutely. more restrictions coming in in Ireland. You know, we have a population of 4.4 million in Ireland. We're talking about two suicides a day. There's massive evictions going on. The banks are pushing and pushing and pushing. And just, it's unbelievable what's going on. And on one hand, I'm hearing that the cabal have the back against the wall. And they, there are just defections going on. But on the other side, I'm physically seeing, um, you know, George Orwell, 1984. Actually, a worse case of that. Well, the, the answer is twofold. The, the, I guess I'll, I'll go by the earth terms, the Illuminati and Cabal, they've romanticized things among themselves and they've said we will take everything and give nothing until there's a short drop and a sudden stop. That's referring to being caught and hung on a rope, being lynched. And a mor mortally wounded bear is that it's most dangerous. So these types of false flags are actually going to pick up more. It's going to get a little bit more crazy before you see any type of ramping down. And on the second side, these energetic waves that are coming into the solar system, or actually our solar system is entering into a part of the galaxy that is of a higher vibrational uh, nature, this is affecting the consciousness of a lot of people. And a lot of the lower vibrational 
you know, service to self uh, type of people are having a very difficult time with this. And this is this is behind, you know, I mean, I, I on the television, I don't even watch television anymore. There are, I used to every once in a while turn on the television and every couple of days there would be a, sh- there'd be a shooting. Now mm-hmm. every morning there's two or three shootings. Yeah. On the television. So it's sort of like an end times madness kind of effect. It's having on the consciousness of, of certain people. Well, I totally agree with you on that. I think there's, we've, we've reached some kind of energy where it's just, I don't know what it is, it's just some psychosis or something's happening with energy on the planet. And there's, there's loads of things going on at the moment. I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> there's loads there's loads of kind of negativity going on there's loads of things the shootings and there's bombings and everything else and it's just like uh, the, the the lunatics are running the, the asylum at the moment and it's it's getting concerning to a certain extent yeah people are being triggered all over the place and uh, it's uh, you know and um uh, i i put out on my site that you know the blue avians stated to me that things were going to get worse before it got better. And that anchored a lot of people. They said, you know what? We've been through enough. We've had enough of a bad time. I'm ready for it to be over. I do not want it to get worse. And um, I, I agree yeah. with you on that. There's a few people that I speak to and have said, look, we've had enough. We've, we've been through it. Enough's enough now. We know we're just getting impatient. Just press the button, do the reset, or do what needs to be done. Right. You know, I, I would like to define the term blue avians for a moment for those who don't already know what he's talking about, because some people have not read any of his stuff. Okay, go Thank ahead, you. David. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Um, so in the 1980s, uh, one of my top insiders actually worked for Ronald Reagan. His code name was Mr. Do because he was like the Tesla of the black ops. He invented all kinds of weird technology. And so he was there with Reagan and Reagan's top advisors, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in the 1980s when they were wrestling with a very astonishing thing that happened, which is an object about the size of the planet Neptune came into our solar system. It was cloaked, uh, but it was very evident to them that it was there, and it started to circle the planets. It went to Pluto, circled around Pluto, went to Neptune, circled around Neptune, went to Uranus, And then once it got around there, they went out to intercept it with the craft that they have that we're not supposed to know about, going all the way back to Roswell and even before that. And the beings just said, we're peaceful explorers taking a cruise around the solar system. And the cabal people said, well, get the heck out of here. You're not wanted here. And they said, okay, fine, we'll go, no problem. Well, then, as Corey has indicated, uh, beginning in the late 1990s, we had a huge proliferation of giant spears come into our solar system. And I was following this story on a website called cyberspaceorbit.com. There was a guy, Kent Stedman, who was talking about what he called sun cruisers. And right on the NASA feed of SOHO, which is the solar observation satellite, we were seeing these huge planet-sized glowing objects coming and going out of the sun. And I wondered what the heck was going on. Nobody really knew back then. Well, it turns out that these spheres have been coming in all along, but then there was a huge spike of them around 2012, which coincidentally or not coincidentally is the end date of the Mayan calendar. Hmm. Uh, this is something that people can laugh off on the Internet and say, oh, these guys are just making up a bunch of stuff. Yet I've heard it from multiple insiders who demonstrated credibility that this is happening, and it is a very big shock to the space program because – what has occurred is that these spheres have beings that have showed up in them that they have never encountered. Now, they've encountered many, many thousands of different types of extraterrestrial life, all of which are more or less hominid or human in appearance to some degree. They have a, they have a head, they have arms and legs, they walk on two feet. That's very standard. But what they haven't seen is these beings that have showed up in these spheres It's caused great confusion, and interestingly enough, the same faction of the space program that Corey worked in, which is called Solar Warden, actually has broken away from the rest of the space program, and they are the ones that started this initiative to defeat the Cabal on Earth 
to bring down the financial tyranny that is now threatening Ireland, that's now threatening Greece and many other countries as well. And their goal is to get us all this technology. They couldn't have done that on their own. They don't have the capability. And what's happened is that these sphere beings, of which the blue avians literally were saying is a human bird morph, it's a, a humanoid bird, mm. Uh, these blue avians are one of five groups that are helping ensure that we have this smooth transition into this golden age. But they have to do this under the prime directive. They have to follow free will, which means they can't just come in and rescue us. That would totally destroy what they're trying to facilitate. We need to be the ones to create the change. They're just going to help us. It's like the mother lion giving her cub a partially killed animal, but the cub has to finish off the kill. It's the same thing they're doing with us here. Okay, well, what about the negative ETs? They don't seem to be following any prime directive. They don't have a choice but to follow what is called the rules that several different insiders have told me about, meaning that we on Earth ultimately are in a holographic illusion mm. in which it appears that the negative is doing whatever it wants, but it's actually very tightly contained. And they try and try and try to do all kinds of stuff that would create mass depopulation, and those things are not allowed. So we have to really look at what is happening on Earth as a direct reflection of what has been permitted to occur by our collective free will. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to read out some of the information here that it was on um, Corey's website. And maybe yeah, both of you can have a um, just mention or talk about it. It says here, top cabal insiders from 2009 said the shift is not 2012 but 2017, which is a massive soul event pushing humanity up vibrationally to fourth density. This is where PSI abilities come in, telepathy, clairvoyance, astral travel, etc. So we, we often hear about the shift or the event going to take place. We've heard this a number of times and we've had a couple of guests on talking about it. So, what is this going to... I mean, without going down the, the New Age side, we talk about ascension as well. But what's really going to happen? I mean, is this kind of, we're going to lose our physical bodies, we're going to die, or, or what's really going... How can we, can we clarify the ascension, this energy shift for us? Well, I'll, I'll start and then hand it over to Corey. And okay. the reason why I'm starting is because I've been out there with my own website since 1999. I've been putting content online since 1996 talking about this subject, and what most people are unaware of is that there is a massive degree of heavy, heavily verified scientific data that gives us an insight into this. So, for example, in 2000, I found a paper called Planetophysical State of the Earth and Life by Dr. Oleski Dmitriev, and it was on a website called the Millennium Group. And this was describing a energetic shift that was going on in our solar system where Dr. Dmitriev was pointing out hard data from Russian astrophysical observations showing that the sun and all the planets, they didn't have all of them, they didn't have Mercury, but they had Mars, Venus, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto showing really bizarre, discontinuous, meaning very sudden changes. And these changes included all the stuff that we're seeing on Earth. Temperature increases, brightness increases, very noticeable magnetic field increases, huge spikes in the amount of charged particles in their atmospheres. And so I ended up partnering up with Richard C. Hoagland, the guy that's famous for the Face on Mars scholarship. Mm. And I believe it was back in 2003 that we started to work on this, that where I actually, Richard said to me, David, nobody's going to believe this if it's just Russian scientists. we got to move the ball forward and bring it into the arena of NASA. And so I actually spent about half a year, and I think it was at the beginning of 2004, where all I did is collate the NASA data that was showing that this is happening. So we have now irrefutable data points that there are changes going on on every planet in the solar system. And it's interesting because when you read the official press releases, they don't deny that this is happening. Mm. But what they say is this is a local effect caused by the tilt angle of the planet to the sun. That's usually what they say. Well, that's a conspiracy theory. 
how could all the planets in our solar system simultaneously be tilting in just the right way to get a little more sunlight so they get a little – it's not just a little either. I mean, we're talking, for example, Jupiter has, has increased so much in the last just five years that the difference between the temperature change in, the, in Jupiter's atmosphere is equivalent to the coldest place on Earth suddenly ramping up to the heat of the hottest place on Earth, which is Death Valley. We had a huge storm appear on Saturn a couple of years ago that literally engulfed the entire northern hemisphere of Saturn with this big band that just went all the way around the planet, a huge change in the colors and the striping of, of the planet. We've had just, it, I mean, I could list it off for you. It's, it's an incredible body of data. So, again, people are always out there. The, the paid trolls are saying, oh, there's no proof, there's no evidence. We have an abundance of evidence. The question also is, what did the ancient prophecies say? And that's what's going to get to the, to the meat of your question. I'm trying to get through this as quick as I can. Okay. I've also done the research. Uh, Graham Hancock wrote a wonderful book called Fingerprints of the Gods, which I got right after I graduated out of college in 1995. And he talks about two historians who were at the top of their game, had hundreds of cited papers to their names, Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha von de Schen. They were the darlings of the history community up until they did their grand theory, the grand hypothesis that tied it all together, which they published in a huge book that could be very effective as a weapon if you threw it at someone. It's called Hamlet's Mill. It's ginormous. And what they did in that book is to show 35 different ancient cultures around the world, which includes all the big religions, all the stuff we know of, and a lot of stuff that's much more obscure Everything from the middle of the Pacific Ocean to the Arctic wasteland, wherever there's a culture, you find that they all were given prophecy about us going through some sort of consciousness change, some sort of activation of what it means to be human that fundamentally alters the essence of humanity as, as a species, so that we essentially seem to be going from a being of flesh and blood to a being that is predominantly of light. And so I also love to cite the Tibetan rainbow body in this, which is Tibetan Buddhism was founded around 800 AD by a guy called Padmasambhava, who apparently could fly and could push his hand through rock and could create all kinds of weird miracles. He could cause uh, patterns to form in rocks. He just waves his hand over it and these uh, shapes appear in the rocks. And there's still plenty of sacred sites in Tibet you can go to where that happened. Those are called termas. Um, what he ultimately did is to turn into light at the end of his life, and then 25 of his disciples did the same thing. And when he turned into light, the light was rainbow-colored. It was like beams of different colors. And so they called it the rainbow body. And there are a series of teachings that are specific enough and useful enough that the Tibetans have now documented 160,000 people who have ascended and turned into this rainbow body. And so then that would lead to the question, well, that's pretty freaking cool. Mm. What did they do? Yeah. And the, the teaching is actually remarkably simple. All you have to do, all you have to do, right? <laughs> all you have to do is have every thought be a loving thought. Wow, that's going to be a hard one. <laughs> I haven't so, gotten there yet. <laughs> no. So, so what is happening is that on a collective level, that's like the Olympics, where you can actually get out of here anytime you want, turn into light body whenever you want, if you can make it to that level of perfection. But what's happening to us as a whole now is that our planet has turned into a pyramid. The original purpose of the Great Pyramid is the same thing. You go up into the king's chamber, there's a coffin in there. That's the granite sarcophagus. Oh, well, people say, oh, that means there was a mummy in the pyramid. No, 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 no. The granite sarcophagus is an ascension chamber. The pyramid was originally built by the same beings who have now come back in all these spheres, and they made a grand showing back then, giving us this pyramid, which originally had mirror-polished white limestone. That's been proven. The thing looked like a marble sculpture sitting in the desert, gleaming white. And you go into the sarcophagus, and if you have a person in there who's part of the priesthood, who's trained and has a, a special crystal they would use, you go through this horrifying ordeal. 
where all of your negativity is shot up in your face, all the things you've done to hurt people, all the things you've done that cause pain, you have to face off against that. And it's a terrifying nightmare. But if you can burn off your karma in this nightmare and forgive yourself for what you've done, then you literally come out of that sarcophagus as a being who has ascended. Now, the, the Napoleon Bonaparte went in there and laid down in the sarcophagus overnight when France was in Egypt, and he had a terrifying experience, and he said, I will never go near that pyramid again. What's mm -hmm. happening to us as a planet is akin to the pyramid initiation. So, Alan, this gets back to your original question, which is, it seems like the train is running off the tracks. Mm, yeah. It seems like the Illuminati are winning. Yeah. What's actually happening is that a certain amount of negativity is being permitted to occur so that we as a planet are getting that pyramid nightmare planet-wide. We're seeing the negativity, all the things that we didn't bother to look at, mm. that we didn't care enough, that we, didn't, we weren't busy enough, we were lazy, we were watching television, we were drinking beer, we didn't pay attention to the stuff that was going on all around us, we didn't pay attention to a Luciferian cult advertising their Lucifer symbols in our faces in movies and music videos and the Olympics ceremonies and the Grammy Awards. All this stuff has been going on. Now we're seeing it and we're like, oh, my God. And that's part of what cracks the shell that we built around our hearts, leading to the consciousness awakening that is predicted to happen in all these ancient cultures. These extraterrestrials told us what they were going to do. They put it in these prophecies. We lost touch with them. But the prophecies are real. And the electromagnetic changes in our solar system is just a physical effect of this vibrational shift, which is ultimately activating our consciousness. And in order to get the healing, we have to throw up. So if you throw up, you'll feel better. And that's what we're seeing right now on Earth. It's pretty ugly, but yeah, it's, it's a necessary part of the process. Definitely. We are going through it all right. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty bad. But, Corey, what's your take on it? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Well, as far as the dates, um, I when I was in the programs, there I, I had seen the dates that they had predicted a lot of this to happen were between the year 2018 and the year 2023. Mm. And apparently things sped up. Something happened. I, I haven't myself put out the year 2017. Um that uh, I, I'm, I'm very careful not to put out dates. Yeah, you have to be very careful with that, yeah. Ju just, to, just to be clear. Yeah. And in the secret space program, the, the people that are the scientists that were studying this, they, they were actually going out and looking at these energetic clouds and studying them. And they're, they're more nuts and bolts. They, they weren't doing all the research that David was doing. So they, you know, they, they, they didn't quite know exactly what was going to happen to people. A, a lot of them thought that maybe people that they consider star seeds and wanderers, and we can get into what that means later, um, were going to maybe kickstart and, and, and start to have some ascended powers in, before everyone else. And These are the star seeds you're talking about, the, the people who are awake and spiritually aware. Correct. Yeah, okay. And they didn't know if everyone was going to start to have this waking, awakening and uh, shared consciousness ability quicker than others, or if it was just everyone was going to have it at once. So... From from my perspective, I think this is one of the reasons they guided me towards David Wilcock was he had done all of this type of homework, and he had a lot of other experience that I did not. And there's a lot of stuff that, you know, he, it's, a lot of his information has gone hand in glove with what I experienced. And it's it's been really amazing to have the conversations with him about about some of this information. 
Okay. Now, talking about the... We, we mentioned before we went live about the Planet X Nirabu, and we know there's a load of uh, PSYOP out there. As one of our guests said to us, which I think is quite appropriate, if you bury the truth in a, in a barrel full of lies, it's very hard to find. And obviously, there's so much PSYOP out there. People... You don't know whether you're coming or going because there's so many people talking about different things. I mean, even if you want to look at flat earth and all that kind of stuff. So just passing that back over to David. David, you wanted to mention the Planet X Nirubu thing. Give us your take on that. Well, my personal impression of this does have some degree of emotional charge because I originally did an article that was an interview for Junvalu Melchizedek's magazine at the time. He had Spirit of Mott. It was a subscription-based magazine. And so my co-author for our original, the first book that came out about me, dealt with the idea that I have this stunning facial similarity to the noted American psychic Edgar Cayce. Huh. And it goes beyond that because the planets at the time of his birth and the planets at the time of my birth, there's absolutely no denying that they have an astonishing connection. And that connection is so exact that I was literally born in the only time in a 127-year period after Edgar Casey's death where that alignment would occur. Now, Casey was not just an ordinary guy. He would lie down be put into a deep state of trance, and there's 14,000 documented readings that he did where in trance, unconscious, he began speaking with omniscient intelligence. And whatever was talking through him always used the term we, not I, so it appeared to be a group of beings of some kind. This was before the UFO era. Casey died in 1945, so nobody ever asked him about flying saucers. But it was very clear that whoever was speaking through him had some sort of administrative managerial role in the spirit world over our planet, that they were running the show, more or less. So I come back in, apparently, having been Edgar Casey in my past life, we can debate whether reincarnation exists, but those who believe it does say that there's a facial similarity as one of the core aspects of this, and character similarities. And so I started to have the same types of experiences that Edgar Casey was having, which led to, in November 10th, 1996, having some kind of higher intelligence speaking through me, which took the form of, uh, I'm getting notifications. Are you guys texting me or something? Am I talking too much? No, no, <laughs> no. no okay. Not from us. sure. Not from us. Um, I'm getting little texts on Skype here, so somebody's trying to text me. Anyway, um, I, it is a very complex, weird story, and I'm just trying to lay out the basics for everybody. So what happened is I had this guy come forward, and he pushed me to want to write a book about this. I did not want to have a book come out about me being Edgar Casey, possibly, in my past life. But I will say that beginning in November 1996 – I would start to wake up in the morning, and I would hear words in my mind, and I, there was a very specific protocol that goes back to remote viewing, which I had read about from Art Bell show. There were various guests, some of whom had written books that taught you how to do remote viewing. I learned it extensively. I practiced it, and I got to a point where I could pass words through my mind and be in a deep enough state of trance that those words were not affected by my personality. I did not know what I was saying. And they often were encrypted. They would use weird dreamlike language that my conscious mind couldn't understand when I was deep under trance. But then later on, I'd be able to make sense out of it. And, and just a bizarre example, which is kind of unflattering, was that one of the things they would do if they wanted to talk about me and they wanted to sneak it past my mind is they would use the feminine gender and they'd use the, the, the name Christina. And then I realized they're talking about the... Christ consciousness, the Christ self. Hmm. So Christina is going to da 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 da, and she thinks da da da. And so you know, you say this stuff, you're you're so far out, you, your body wants to fall asleep so bad, and you just have to keep yourself right on the edge of falling asleep. That's the trick. So you're just blah 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 blah. You don't even know what you're saying. You just blah 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 blah. Then you go back later on and you transcribe it, and you go, oh my goodness gracious, because what would happen is. 
<clears throat> I'd have a stack of cassettes on my desk. I still have all of them. Uh, and back then there was no MP3 recorders. This was, we're talking 1996. And I would sit down maybe two, three weeks after I dictated onto these cassettes and I transcribed them. And they would be describing what happened to me right before I sat down at my desk, which was astonishing. And it happened over and over again. I'll give you one example. There's many examples I like to use. I lived right next to Woodstock in upstate New York. And I went down Route 28 and I went to Woodstock. And I went to this kind of hippie uh, deli. There's a guy in there who starts talking about uh, Joseph Campbell. And he's describing how Campbell says that religions are like different, different pieces of software to access the same intelligent universe, which ultimately is all one and we're all part of the same thing. So religion is just software. So I have this whole conversation with him. I go back home. First thing I do is go up to my bedroom because I always want to hear what, what the tapes are going to say. Sit down, pop the tape in the recorder, hit play, start transcribing. And it's my voice talking on behalf of these beings. And the first thing that my voice says is, we are now downloading new software. That freaking blew me away. So when you have these experiences, and I'm not saying this happened once or twice. I'm saying this happened hundreds of times. One of the very first clients I had lived in uh, Tennessee, and he got a tape from me in the mail, not knowing what was going to be on it. He'd woken up from a dream that morning where he had a tripod, and one of the three legs of the tripod wouldn't stay straight. The first thing that happens when the reading starts talking to him on the tape is it says the tripod represents that you're not able to support yourself at this time spiritually and you have an un a shaky foundation. And he was so blown away because how could this be possible? How could they have known what my dream was? And I didn't have this happen once or twice. I had this happen many, many hundreds of times. And I became convinced that there was a, there, there was a directed intelligence speaking through me. I never in a million years expected that they would actually show up but that does appear to be what's happened. So to get back to the Planet X question, <clears throat> the first debut with my co-author of what became the book, The Reincarnation of Edgar Cayce, our grand debut was in this interview that he did with me that was published somewhere around September 7th, 2001. Now, why is that date interesting? five days or four days before September 11th. Hmm. This article comes out, and it talks about the changes in our solar system. September 11th hits, and everybody needs good news. Everybody needs to hear something positive. Somebody enterprisingly took that article, stripped it of all the stuff about my connection to Edgar Casey, stripped it of all my references where I actually had links to these things, and then said that all of the data that I put in there about the changes in our solar system were only done by Russian scientists, which wasn't even true. I'd already been backing it up with NASA back then. Huh. That article went so viral that there were hundreds of thousands of websites that actually had linked to it. And on the email back in those days, it reached millions and millions of people. And nobody knew that I had written it or any of the greater context of where it came from. And then the Planet X people came in and they took that data and they used it to support their hypothesis, which is that all the changes I talked about and very clearly delineated that it was caused by us going into a galactic energy zone. They said, no, all this is because a planet is coming into the solar system. And on May 15, 2003, we're all going to die. And, of course, that didn't happen. Huh. So that was my attempt to answer your question, and I'm gobbling up gobs of time here. But I feel like since this is our debut interview and we've never come forward before, this backstory really fills in what happened to me and the fact that these beings have apparently been in contact with me for 20 years. I never expected they were going to show up. And uh, this is, it's become a very, very interesting story, a very rapidly evolving story. So you don't think Planet X or Nirubu is going to be coming in or have any effect on the planet, which is what a lot of people are saying at the moment. There, you know, because there are there are a number of people out there talking about it and people saying, "Look, there's photos. There it is. There it's coming in." 
Um, so, I mean, what's the how could how would you explain the physical side of people? Are they seeing Canadex or what are they seeing? Okay, well, we do have a brown dwarf that we are orbiting around as a star, and that is, you know, some people like to make a nice fit with Nibiru for that. That is true. This grand year that all 35 of those ancient cultures I was telling you about, the 25,000-year cycle they're all so obsessed with, uh. that Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Schen, these two great historians, put it in their book. All those prophecies talk about the 25,000-year cycle. That cycle is an orbit that we do around a brown dwarf. That's been conclusively demonstrated by, uh, I'm trying to think of his name off the top of my head. Anyway, the point is, this data, I've talked about it in my books, and it's on my show on you know wisdomteachings.com. You can read all about it and watch the show. The point is, yes, we are in an orbit around a brown dwarf. No, it never gets close enough to us to cause trouble. Uh, and... The Planet X theory is that this body will intrude into our solar system and will cause great cataclysmic disruption of the Earth and the other planets in our solar system. And my answer to that is, if you take a car and you put it in neutral, and then you take a refrigerator magnet and you try to pull the car with the magnet, the car is not going to move. The energetics in our solar system are so powerful the planets are in precisely defined harmonic orbits. They, do not, they, they don't just fly around. There's sacred geometry, which you could get into why the geometry is a function of sound vibration and all that. Uh. The point is the planets are very precisely held in place by massive forces. Nothing the size of another planet is going to come in and mess that up. It's simply not possible. The, the mass of Planet X, even at the most generous estimates of its size, would still be only 0.01% of the mass of the sun, and, and it's like saying that you could fling a piece of sand at a cruise ship and have the cruise ship move in the ocean. It's not going to happen. Okay, and Corey, have you, in all the meetings that you've done off planet, have you come across or had discussions with people regarding Planet X and Nirubu? Has that come into the conversation at all? What has come into the uh, conversation has been uh, that uh, we're a part of a uh, failed binary star system. Um, the uh, plethora, the, the the vast majority of star systems out there are at least binary in nature, and uh, we we do have a brown dwarf that uh, that is that we have in a dance going around the the galaxy that our our sun is doing. So, but nothing about an actual planet called Nibiru or any other name that uh, is a protruder planet that comes into uh, our solar system every 3,600 years that busts through the Oort cloud and uh, reaps havoc. Mm, that's what they're saying. And so with all the issues that we're having on the planet at the moment, I mean, we're getting heightened volcanic activity. We're getting dormant volcanoes going off. We're getting flooding. We're getting plate movements. We're getting extreme weather. I mean, stuff that we haven't had before or we know of through records. What do you put that down to? I put that down to the... Um, the huge change in background energy, the, the energetic, we're moving into a high energy area of the galaxy. And uh, as David talked about earlier, these changes are taking place on every planet in, in our solar system. And our sun is having massive changes. Hmm. So, and uh, there, we have an immediate star cluster, not just our local sun, but there's a star cluster around us that is moving in to this region of space, and this the whole star cluster is experiencing these types of changes. And um, it has to do with the ebb and flow of these waves of, en of energy that are coming in like tsunamis and having an effect on, on not only the... Um, the people, like we described earlier, but yeah. also the the planets, the tectonics, the mm. the weather, and um, 
um, the, the sun. Having a major effect. And this ascension process, um, this shift that's going to take place, just kind of clarifying that, is this a physical shift? I mean, are we going to, what's going to happen to us from our physical bodies? I mean, are we just going to start developing uh, these abilities? Are our bodies going to change in some way, DNA, and or do we, I mean, what, what is your take on this shift, uh, this ascension? Well, from my perspective, I've seen up up in the uh, research vessel, I've seen um, several different theories. Down here on the Internet, I've seen an amazing number of theories. But from, from my perspective, I don't think there's – I really don't think there's any way to fully know until we experience it. Um, there, there are, you know, there are a lot of theories about it. Uh, it's definitely going to be a massive change in consciousness. Mm. And what, you know, has been proven, everything around us is vibration. Mm. Yeah. All matter, all energy, even the thoughts right now in our minds, they're all different states of vibration. And as the vibration of our consciousness is raised, so is, and our and we realize the power of our joint consciousness, we can have a direct effect on matter and energy around us. Uh. So, you know, that may be one of the first steps that we notice to start happening. That, okay. That's, you know, kind of from my, my, my perspective. Okay. Well, David has, yeah. David's done a lot more uh, research into this and, and has a lot more theories on, on what, what's possible. Well, I'll, I'll pass this. This is on your uh, site again, and I'll pass this over to David. And it says here on, it was a question number four, or a section number four, it said, the people who are aware of this shift are going to have the best seats in the house. I also think all the people who have been bravely seeking the truth with varying degrees of success will experience karmic shifts of a lesser degree and will help anchor others around them. Each awake person will be a guide for others as things heat up before the event. David? Well, I totally agree with that sentiment you just read. Um, there is an ongoing debate about what we would call the gradual versus spontaneous theories. Uh, the gradual theory has an abundance of scientific evidence. We know that gradual DNA changes are already occurring to human beings. Mm. There's some really amazing studies that show that. For example, a University of Wisconsin anthropologist, Dr. John Hawkes, studied the human DNA molecule, and this actually included DNA testing mummies, and he found that in the last 5,000 years, our DNA has evolved so rapidly that the overall structure of the molecule is 7% different than it was 5,000 years ago. Mm. And that is totally unprecedented. There's uh, something called the Flynn effect in which we find out that IQ scores are going up so fast that every 10 years they have to change the scoring system because a 100 is supposed to be average. That's occurring across 20 countries, including countries that don't have literacy. We also had a study that was recently done. Actually, it was done by the British, but it was based on American skulls going back to the mid-1800s, showing that the average cranial volume of the brain for an American has gone up in the last 150 years so large that the size of the brain on average has increased by the volume of a tennis ball. So if you took a tennis ball-sized chunk of brain mass and shoved it inside somebody's head in a 150-year period, that's how much larger our brains have gotten. Mm. And this obviously is not just Americans. It's just that, that was the base of skulls they had to study. I started to say so, a lot of people would have a lot of problems believing that with the way Americans have been behaving. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you're coming from, yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you on that one. So these, these data points are irrefutable. We also know a Russian scientist named Dr. Peter Garyayev was able to take eggs that had been laid by a salamander and then shine a laser beam through them, and that shouldn't do anything. But the laser apparently picked up whatever energy it is that makes a salamander, and then you take that salamander laser beam 
and you beam it into eggs that were laid by a frog. Well, guess what happens? And this, I was talking about this in the article that was plagiarized all the way back in 2001, right before September 11th. The frog eggs get energized with salamander energy, and they grow into salamanders. I remember. And they show no evidence of having been frogs. I remember that. I read that article that you put up. I read about this. I found it very interesting. Yeah. 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 So what I'm saying is, if you, if you think about the salamander beam, there is a human upgrade beam that is coming through our sun right now that is beaming into us, and it is actually altering our DNA while we are alive. Hmm. Huh. Now, that's one part of it. The other part of it is what happened to Padmasambhava, where he bursts into a light being, and something fundamentally happens to him. So, one of the things that all of, well, not all, I would say, in specific terms, we have Zoroastrian prophecy, we have Hindu prophecy, and we have certain Christian prophecies, all clearly saying that they are expecting that our son is going to have some sort of surge of massive brightness that's much more than what we normally see. Now, in, in Hindu prophecy, they call it the Samvartaka fire, S-A-M-A-V-A-R-T-A-K-A. In Zoroastrian prophecy, they call it Fraso Kareti, or Kareti, F-R-A-S-O-K-E-R-E-R-T-I. And then in Christian prophecy, they, they call it the glory of the Lord, that it will shine from the east unto the west. Would that be the uh, rapture? Would, would they call that the rapture? What's that? Would they call that the rapture? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the rapture does appear to be one variant of the scenario, which has been grossly misinterpreted by most people calling themselves Christians. Mm. And then there's the majority of Christians are kind of middle of the road and don't even really buy into the rapture. It's only fundamentalism where it usually is heavily discussed. Mm. But what people need to understand is this is not just Christian prophecy. We're talking 35 different ancient cultures. And I'm not saying there's a bunch of other ones left to the side. I'm saying anybody who ever had spiritual teachings from the gods, anybody who ever wrote stuff down that we've inherited, that's the 35. They all say something totally amazing and wonderful is going to happen. And then, thinking of that line, something wonderful is going to happen, you have certain authors who are giving us a glimpse of this in movies. Like, for example, Arthur C. Clarke, at the end of the movie 2010, you have the whole planet Jupiter get turned into a sun, some kind of big energetic emission. Arthur C. Clarke also talked about at the end of Childhood's End, that the whole solar system bursts with light. 2001 ends with the commander of the HAL ship, David Bowman. He goes into this vortex and he experiences some sort of evolution into what they call the star child. So clearly the ancient prophecies are expecting that there is going to be some sort of discontinuous energetic activation of what it means to be human. And what we really don't know and nobody knows is, is there going to be a solar... Uh, flash, how much will it do, how quickly will we change once it happens. But it was very interesting when I first started to talk to Corey that he had encountered, actually he had a remote viewing where he encountered information suggesting there was going to be a solar event and that it would have very positive effects on Earth. Excellent. Yes. So, so this negativity that you were talking about earlier about you know things going mad on the planet and it's part of a, a kind of karma... There's a big talk about September, October, and the banking system collapse. Do you guys know anything about this? Do you think it's part of the whole kind of the cabal, shutting down the cabal system? Well, Corey has direct contact with the Alliance, whereas I only get it secondhand, so he's probably more qualified on this. So I have a lot to say, but he actually has direct contact with them. So. Okay, Corey. Well, first of all, we need to clarify. There is an Earth Alliance that's made up of quite a few different groups that loosely work together. And uh, this involves the BRICS Alliance and uh, all, whole, all these other groups you've been hearing about. And they've been working to create a completely new financial system 
and this financial system is just going to be a, a whole new, basically, financial debt system, but they're going to try to clear the slates, start over, and um, from what I hear, a lot of the people in the East are saying the West had their 100 years, now the East wants its 100 years. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, from the information I've been getting, but they they, sh they should call the Illuminati. They should instead of the Illuminati, they should call them the Great Infiltrators. They have infiltrated just about everything you can think about, and they've infiltrated quite a lot of the BRICS groups and other parts of the Earth Alliance. And uh, we even had a problem with them infiltrating uh, some of the uh, Secret Space Program Alliance. And um, it, it appears that um, what they're going to try to do is co-opt it and try to set up a, a New World Order 2.0. Uh -huh. And there, there are certain good elements inside the Earth Alliance, the, the, the Earth Alliance, that are fighting against this, don't want it to happen, that, that really want to set up a, a new, good, fair, equitable financial system. The Secret Space Program Alliance wants to bring down technology that basically is going to overnight do away with any need for a financial system. And this right here scares a lot of people to death. They're, you know, they say, you know, this sounds like socialism. You're going to take away our money. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, and, uh, you know, when you have, you know, food replication, you have free energy, you have harmonic and light uh, medical technology, technology that desalinates water and can turn all the deserts green, erase hunger from the earth to where humans are no longer a burden on the earth, changes the way of life from us being debt slaves, working nine to five coming home exhausted, watching a few hours of the telly, and then going to bed next day, get dressed, repeat, mm. to having a more fruitful life following our, you know, um, what inspires us doing what we want to. That's, that's what they're attempting to do. These technologies that they would bring down would literally collapse all financial systems and the need for financial systems. Well, I'd I'd love now, for them to do now, that. There, there's always talk. There's always talk about a September surprise, an October surprise. Mm. There's going to be a financial collapse. Mm. And one of the things that has been t mentioned is that we are going to need a financial collapse and an exposure of all of the criminal activities for the normal average Joes out there to become angry enough and to wake up and see that they have been fooled and, and, and criminals have been running things for so long to finally start to make the changes themselves. Hmm. I totally agree. I think that's, uh, that's what we need to do. The exposure, I mean, w there's an awful lot of people over here in Ireland anyway, woken up in all different levels because of the austerity that's going on and people are beginning to wake up in mass which is brilliant to see but we need more exposure we need more exposure of the criminals on what's going on I mean we can see an awful lot but the trouble is we can't seem to do an awful lot about it you know I mean an eye for an eye is that really the right way to go when you don't really want to go down that way in a karmic way so Ab yeah absolutely not and the way they've there, – there was a, a Disney movie called Ants to where they had the grasshoppers that constantly had this mound of ants gathering all the food for them and, and doing all the labor for them. And um, there was this one scene where one of the ants asked – I mean one of the grasshoppers asked the, the head grasshopper, they're just ants. What are they going to do? And – once all of us ants that we're, we're all bustling around in our little ant hill, once we stop bustling around and, and realize the power we have in numbers alone compared to this 
point zero zero one percent or or whatever that alone has them terrified they have to keep they have to create strife between each other they have to create racial tension they have to create uh, disharmony between religions they have to create all of these problems to keep us at each other's throats so we don't turn our attention to them mm. this is all manufactured on purpose and it is done to keep us from turning our attention to them if there is a, a large enough event that causes us to wake up and turn our attention to them, and there after that, you start seeing some data dumps of some of the Snowden information, the major Snowden information that he has that has fully been decrypted now, and some of the latest hacks that have occurred that you've only heard the tip of the iceberg about in Europe and the U.S. that has been done by the Alliance, then this is going to be information that is going to – it's it's really, you know, the eye for the, an eye for an eye thing. It's going to be very difficult to not have people wanting to, to set up guillotines and uh, run the elites through guillotines. Well, you're just you know. talking about the French Revolution, basically, aren't you? You know, right. that, that's really what happened. You know, mm-hmm. took out the guillotines and chopped off a few heads. Um, you did say you had an exclusive on the show, and I'm just watching the chat room there, and people are saying we believe Curry has some ex- information or an exclusive. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I'm I'm not exactly sure which bit of information is the ex- exclusive. Or not? Um, I mean, we've. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting to be fully debriefed. When I, I was, many people know, the last week I was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, shooting some interviews with Guyam TV, and uh, the really wonderful people out there. It was great. I um, missed out on a couple very big meetings. And the person uh, who goes by the pseudonym Lieutenant Colonel Gonzalez, who is actually a delegate with the Secret Space Program, attended two meetings in my absence. Uh, One of them was with uh, a Draco Alliance Federation, and the other one was with what we're calling a ET Super Federation um, Alliance Council. And um, some sort of deal was struck with this human-like ET super federation uh, having to do with some of the more positive ETs that have been stuck here on Earth since December. 